During the 1920s and 30s, the exploits of record-setting pilots like Charles Lindbergh and Amelia Earhart had captivated the nation and thousands of young men and women who clamored to follow in their footsteps. But young African-Americans who aspired to become pilots met with significant obstacles, starting with the widespread racism and the belief that Black people could not learn to fly or operate sophisticated aircraft. The Tuskegee Airmen were the first Black military aviators in the U.S. Army Air Corps, a precursor to the U.S. Air Force. Trained to the Tuskegee Army Airfield in Alabama, they flew more than 15,000 individual sorties in Europe and North America during World War II. Their impressive performance earned them more than 150 distinguished flying crosses and helped encourage the eventual integration of the U.S. Armed Forces. The Tuskegee Airmen were comprised of not just pilots, but a ground crew. It took eight to 12 men or women to keep those planes in the air. Doctors, nurses, supply and inventory, navigators, fuelers, runway engineers, because somebody had to build those runways for them to take off and land those. Now here we are with more than 80 years approaching the anniversary of the Tuskegee Airmen. Our mission is to preserve the legacy of the Tuskegee Airmen to promote excellence and leadership among minority youth and position the Tuskegee Airmen for sustainability and perpetuity. The Tuskegee Airmen story will continue to shape future generations. Tuskegee Airmen is dedicated to introducing young people across the nation to STEM with emphasis on aviation, aerospace, and transportation. Our legacy lives on through many different programs from our youth educational assistance to the National Military Awards. We are active in perpetuating the story of the Airmen. For more information about our Atlanta chapter Tuskegee Airmen and our summer program, please go to our website, www.atlantatai.org and check on our youth programs for more information. Thank you. Our chapter is more than 45 years old now. We have a program called TAST, Tuskegee Airmen. Ladies and gentlemen and students, welcome to Congressman Hank Johnson's 2022 Black History Month program entitled Blacks in Aviation, Past and Present. This Black History Month program is to honor Black pioneers, such as the three Tuskegee Airmen from the 4th Congressional District, Mr. Val Archer, Mr. Andrew Keyes, and Mr. Vernon Sports. We're going to honor our past and our present with stories from today as well. These airmen, while being recognized for their courage and their perseverance, they have paved the way for people of color to pursue a career in aviation. It's vital to Congressman Hank Johnson to share these, their stories and to expose the youth of today to aviation. Ladies and gentlemen, at this time, I would like to introduce to some and present to others, our Congressman from the 4th Congressional District of Georgia, Mr. Henry C. Hank Johnson. Congressman Johnson. Thank you, Eric, and hello, everybody. I want to welcome everyone to the uh, 2021 Black History Program, which is entitled Blacks in Aviation, Past and Present. And I want to if you'll give me a second. Um, kind of lost my place here. Okay. And it's an honor and a privilege to be able to celebrate the contributions of Black aviators who have been trailblazing in the skies while serving as role models for the young aspiring aviators coming up behind them. We don't often hear about the accomplishments of Black people in aviation. So today we amplify their achievements by saluting those aviators who pioneered in the sky and those aviators who are today trailblazing in the sky. 
We want the greater public, particularly our young people, to know about careers in aviation while celebrating our Black pioneers in aviation during Black History Month. And we are celebrating those who I will be interviewing this afternoon as part of this program. Your achievements mean so much because we know that minorities are underrepresented in the aviation fields. Because of individuals like yourselves and those before you, I have introduced a bill to boost minorities in aviation. The bill will increase educational opportunities in fields such as piloting, aviation maintenance, and unmanned aircraft systems. We will tap into the unrealized potential of minority students and encourage them to enter well-paying careers while bolstering the aviation workforce. It will also, <clears throat> excuse me, offer scholarships, internships, and apprenticeships. Being home to the world's busiest airport, Hartsfield-Jackson International, with its myriad of aviation career opportunities makes this bill all the more important to my constituents. I consider this bill to be a jobs bill. With events like today, my mission is to spread the word to all while educating our youth about Black pioneers in aviation during this year's Black History Month. And I also want to begin by acknowledging the following dearly departed aviation pioneers of the 4th District, Mr. Val Archer, Mr. Andrew Keyes, Mr. Vernon Sport, uh, and we'd like to present a plaque to their loved ones who are with us today. Those loved ones are Ms. Victoria Archer, wife of Mr. Val Archer, Ms. Gwen Keyes Fleming, who's the daughter of Mr. Andrew Keyes, and Ms. Carla Sport Wyatt, who is the daughter of Mr. Vernon Sport. And also, Ms. Erin Flanagan, who is the daughter of uh, Mr. Calvin Flanagan. But as I understand it, Mr. Flanagan is not uh, with us today. Is that correct? Mr. F Mr. Flanagan's uh, daughter is not with us. Is that correct, Eric? Yes, sir. Yeah, that's correct. Ms. Flanagan okay. is not here All right. today. Okay. I also want to recognize another aviation pioneer from the district, Mr. Calvin Flanagan, one of the first two African-American pilots for Delta Airlines. Mr. Flanagan uh, currently resides in the 4th District, and today we lift him up as well. Mr. Andrew Keyes. Mr. Keyes embarked his earlier years as a constituent of the Distinguished Tuskegee Airmen, Inc. to become one of America's first black military men. Along with this honor, he served as a mechanical engineer for the U.S. government. After completion of his service duty, he received an honorable discharge from the U.S. Army. His spirit will be treasured in the hearts of his loving family who have his memories to sustain them. Mr. Keyes was also one of the Tuskegee Airmen that was honored in the legacies of documented original Tuskegee Airmen upon their death by enshrining them into the Lonely Eagles. Thank you for your service, Mr. Andrew Keyes. More than 80 years ago, when it was thought by many that African Americans were incapable of piloting airplanes, Vernon Kingsley Sport knew he could. After several tries, in 1942, he was enlisted in the Army Air Corps, becoming an aviation cadet at Moton Field in Tuskegee, Alabama, later to become known as the famed Tuskegee Airmen, the Red-Tailed Angels. Mr. Sport was part of the 332nd Fighter Group, who escorted American bombers in World War II against Germany without losing one single airplane. Mr. Sports was also one of the main organizers of the East Coast for the March on Washington in 1963. Thank you for your service, Mr. Vernon Kingsley Sport. And I saw these distinguished gentlemen um, at the front. And it turns out that Val Archer was one of those gentlemen. 
after the ceremony, he came over and he started talking to me and asking me, you know, about my program and said, hey, you know, we've been trying to start a youth program in Atlanta. You know, while we're trying to look around and find one, you've got one already put together in a nice little package. Fast forward, I moved to Atlanta, uh, connected with Val and with a group of wonderful supporters. We implemented that first um, camp. And so it's grown so much over the years and, and we've learned so much. But I'll tell you, Val was there every step of the way. Um, whenever I had, I was a school teacher for a number of years. So whenever there was an event at the school, Val was there. You could always count on it. First job with Delta was in 1968. I started off in maintenance. In those days, uh, the goal was to just join Delta in any department, any area, just to get your foot in the door. I, you know, took flying lessons, you know, to obtain all of my uh, certificates. In 1976, Delta announced they were going to hire. So I said, I'm going to fill out the application. I think I'm ready. They called and said, you pass everything. We'd like to offer you a job in flight ops if you would accept. And so I did. <laughs> just a few years removed from the 60s, which was the Civil Rights Act, Voting Rights Act. Sam Grady was the very first African-American pilot hired at Delta. And I remember one of our old schedulers, they called him Coach. Coach called and said, Cal, I have a trip for you. I signed in the next morning and said, S. Grady. And I said, is this Sam? And it was Sam. He walked up. He said, good morning. How have you been? I said, fine. And we shook hands. And he said, you see, we're flying together. And I said, yeah, I did. <laughs> I would land in Birmingham, you know, in Jackson, Mississippi. And uh, that gate agent would come up to the aircraft to retrieve the times and the fuel remaining, et cetera. And you'd get the double take like, you know, I can't believe it. Both of you guys are black, you know, in the cockpit, you know. We were in the deep south. So we were the first all uh, African-American cockpit crew in the history of Delta Airlines. Yeah, I was always a believer that ability does not come with skin color. If you're male or female, it doesn't matter. If you have the ability and the drive and the desire, uh, nothing else matters. We now want to turn our attention to our very special guest, who the congressman will be interviewing. Congressman, I'll pass it back to you, sir. All right. Okay. Well, first we have uh, Master Sergeant W.O. Smith, who was one of 300 Tuskegee Airmen. We also have Dr. Sheila Chamberlain, who is the first black woman intelligence combat pilot. And we also have Captain Barrington Irving, who held the record for the youngest pilot to pilot a plane solo across the world, or around the world, actually. Um, and uh, all of these uh, individuals are quite impressive and I appreciate them being with us today. I want to start with Dr. Chamberlain. Uh, Dr. Chamberlain, uh, where did your love for flying uh, come from? How did that uh, arise in your in your life? Well, Congressman, first of all, thank you for having this today and, and thank your staff for having me here today to contribute to such a wonderful event today. Uh, I have two cousins who are actually Tuskegee Airmen, so my love for flying, and plus I'm a military brat, and I was uh, actually born and raised in post-Nazi West Germany. So, uh, and uh, I graduated from Fort Knox High School, which was the end of Godwin Field was there. Of course, that's where after World War II, that's where the Tuskegee Airmen ended and the Air Force began in 1945. God and Phil Fort Knox, home of the gold. So all my life I've been around planes, even when my father was uh, stationed in Germany for the great lift uh, over Berlin in the 60s. I grew up, I was there when the Berlin Wall went up. So this goes back to my growing up in, uh, in the 50s, all the way up to the 70s in, in Europe. So how did your career in aviation unfold? <laughs> First of all, uh, I went to Spelman College. I am a, a distinguished graduate and a notable. I just have to put a shout out to my Spelman sisters. 
also, uh, flying came natural to me. Like I said, uh, my father had a lot of friends with planes too. So when you've got friends with planes and your cousins are Tuskegee Airmen, uh, back then uh, the love of flying, you had to get your, uh, uh, your license to be on the radio. And once you were on the radio, you could do anything with it. You could become a DJ like I did in Atlanta for a minute when I was at Spelman, or you can go anywhere in the world and fly planes. Uh, the restrictions weren't like they were, you know, after 9-11, everything changed. So uh, I've been flying for maybe since I was a 16, 17 with friends with planes and because of my cousins were Tuskegee Airmen and my father who was an engineer uh, worked a lot with a lot of uh, airfields and a lot of airfields built some airfields as well. Uh, while he was in the military. Mm -hmm. So you ended up becoming uh, a uh, combat intelligence uh, pilot. I don't think that's the right way to, to. A lot of people say that in the army, every service has their own uh, definition of, of uh, uh, who you are. And in the army, it's combat, it's a combat aviator. We call ourselves aviators. Okay. In the so I'm actually an aviator and uh, being that uh, my uh, mentor was Willa Brown, Chappelle, she would always say I was an army aviatrix because that's what they called themselves in the 20s and the 30s at the time. So um, I consider myself an army aviatrix still to this day, but in the army, we were identified as uh, combat intelligence. Uh, the army became a branch in 1985. Uh, and so when it transitioned into that, whatever you were before, and I was in intelligence and you were flying, you actually merged into what was now known as uh, the aviation branch of the United States Army. So before it was the Army Air Corps. And then after 1941, I mean, 1945, the Air Force became 1946. And so uh, each of the prospective branches had their own, still do to this day, their own aviation compartments. Still a lot of the, uh, the uh, boy, I didn't realize I knew this much. I still, I guess I still do. But uh, a lot of the uh, forces still trained, a lot of their helicopters are still trained at our Army Aviation, you know, in Fort, Fort Rucker, Alabama. So we train a lot of the, all of the forces, helicopter pilots, and then they go back to their prospective uh, uh, services. So, but uh, I had a four year ROTC scholarship. Uh, I was supposed to go to West Point with my peers at Fort Knox, but my father said, No way, you're not going to be a guinea pig. But I wind up being one anyway <laughs> in terms of flying uh, planes. Uh, combat aviation intelligence. Uh, I was the first, and they actually let me write, write the doctrine at the time as well because of bringing and merging the two together, this was something else has never been done before. So uh, we actually have those things called combat aviation intelligence and so people go, well, what is that? And I always say, uh, you remember when they went in and got Bin Laden? You remember when they went in and got Bin Laden? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, who brought them there? Yeah, helicopter pilots. Uh, combat intelligence pilots brought them there. That's the thing we do. They were flying we helicopters and they were also uh, flying uh, airplanes in, in the air at that, at, that, at that time. Yeah, reconnaissance in the air, but I'm talking about who brought them inside to, you know, a lot of things that we do is we take the special forces, you know, we fly low, we come in low, uh, uh, we come in with night vision goggles on, you know, you don't see us, we don't talk, you know. Lately, for the past maybe seven years, I've been speaking out, but before, you know, still I wouldn't speak, especially now that the world is, looks like we're going back to the Cold War again. Uh, so, you know, the expertise is needed again, I believe, on, on that front. And uh, Well, is, is it proper for me to inquire uh, what type of aircraft you flew? I flew uh, Hueys. And I flew uh, Blackhawks, and then there's some that I flew that I can't tell you about. But uh, also was uh, a part of uh, bringing in the new aircraft at the time. If you look at uh, the the AH-64 Apache, 
uh, long bowl, that thing on the top of that, I was a part of that program to bring in the age 64. So a lot of people, if you see me around, you'll see me with a lot of Apaches. And I was on that team uh, that, that brought in the age 64. I'm allowed to talk about it now, but at the time I couldn't speak on it. So, so I've left something behind. So every time I look at the uh, age 64 longbow, that thing up there, I was a part of that, the team that, that, that brought that in. Wow, so, that's, that's, you've had a spectacular career. Tell me, how long did you serve in the Army? Total all, let me see, reserve and Army, it added up to 21 years, I believe. So, but uh, uh, I can tell you, Congressman, there's a lot of uh, scars. I've got a lot of scars. You know, you don't go through this being a Black female and not get a lot of scars along the way. And uh, I'm still here. Uh, what were some of those obstacles that you faced uh, as a uh, black female um, combat aviation intelligence pilot? Well, you're always being set up. Aviator, excuse me. You're always being uh, set up for failure. Um, now, mind you, I stayed a lot of time out in the field. And so you didn't exist. So some of the units I was with, you didn't, you didn't exist. Like when I was in Central and South America, uh, Ronald Reagan was saying that uh, there were no women, women uh, officers down there. Well, I was there. So when we went into Grenada, you know, uh, you only hear about two or three uh, officers, but I was a super spook, so I couldn't, you know, you couldn't say anything. So every other day you're in the field with about, maybe about uh, fellow officers and you're in a GP medium. And uh, you know, you're gonna hear the N word all the time, the B word, you know, you're gonna hear those things, the setup. Uh, I never went to sleep because I was the intelligence officer. They have to get the weather from me. And of course they have to get the tactical where the enemy was for me. So I, I always stayed up. I learned to stay up to this day, I rest. I had learned to stay up instead of sleep. Uh, so I just wanted to be frank with you. Those are things that uh, a lot of people have had to endure to include myself, but uh, those were difficult times, difficult years. And uh, the one thing I'm grateful that the God put people in my way uh, to take care of me, to give me rest along the way. And uh, it was good to have the Tuskegee Airmen around and the 70s and the 80s to give me cover. Uh, I was active with the Tuskegee Airmen since 1988. Nancy, uh, Nancy Lieutenant Colon became the president, the first woman, and <clears throat> there when uh, uh, George Lucas and them signed the contract. I was actually physically there when she signed the contract for the movie Red Tails. Mm. So, yeah. so it's uh, um, uh, Willa Brown gave me cover. My mentor. Uh, it didn't matter where I was stationed at. I would call her. Some of those phone bills would be three, four thousand dollar phone bills, but it was worth my life. But uh, she would always be there. They would always be there for me to make sure that everything was all right for me. But uh, when you're out there in the middle of nowhere, doing your job, serving your country, and you're the only woman out there, and you're the only black, black, and you're only black woman out there, so. Uh, I do have a lot of scars, but I'm being, thankfully, I'm being taken care of, and I appreciate that. Well, thank you so much. We are, we're so proud to be able to lift you up today so that others can be inspired by your example and uh, can um, move a little bit further forward based on yes. standing on your shoulders and not having to encounter the, the depth of um, oppression that you uh, had to uh, overcome. But the mere fact that you overcame uh, is a um, testament to the human will, uh, particularly for Black people in America. So thank you so much. Uh,
turn to, to Smith. Uh, I just see Mr. Uh, uh, good to see Mr. Smith. Smith. By the way, by the way, uh, Congressman, uh, a lot of people, I just want to do clarification for um, the Tuskegee Airmen. There were over 15,000 Tuskegee Airmen and then just, uh, just about over about 900 pilots. But the Tuskegee Airmen encompassed every, every one of them who was involved with the experiment, experiment to include not just pilots, everybody, airport maintenance, uh, physical therapy, nurses, there was a lot of women pilots that taught them how to fly that are now finally getting their credit. And uh, uh, I'm also trying to get Willa Brown to receive her, her, uh, Mel, her and her day is coffee because they trained the first 200 pilots before even branching out to all of the, uh, the uh, HBCUs. And finally, one more thing, I wanted to mention the organization of black aerospace professionals, you know, who I'm a hall of famer. And I had to mention them because the transition from a lot of the pilots to uh, OBAP, Organization of Black Airline Pilots at the time in the 70s started in, uh, I believe, 70, they started in 76. Tuskegee Airmen Inc. started, I believe, in 74, 75, officially. And here we are today, and I'm proud to still be with those organizations to include the newest one, Sisters of the Skies, which I'm a senior advisor, which consists of, of uh, women of color. They give, they offer mentorship, scholarships and everything. And I can't wait to hear more about your bill because we're having our gala. I have to get it out. Our gala there this Saturday at the Hyatt downtown. So thank you and I hope I'll be quiet now. Thank you, sir. All right, well, thank you for those very important corrections that you made for the record. And uh, we need to know uh, we need to know our precise uh, contribution and the extent of it. So thank you so much. And by the way, when you DJed while in college, which radio station uh, did you DJ at? WCLK 91.1 on your FM dial. This is Sheila Chamberlain coming at you from Spelman. Just listen up. What a jazzy day. Here we go. All right, and tell me, I still remember that. <laughs> tell me what campus you had to go to in order to- I had to, to go to Clark Atlanta, your campus, sir. Uh, oh, it was Clark Atlanta. I'm so happy that you- uh, <laughs> It was your campus. I used to live in that radio station. So. Yeah, yeah. Well, I, I was there when uh, the radio station first got off the ground. I think they had 10 watts at the time, you know, back in what, 74. But anyway, let me go to uh, let me go to Master Sergeant W. O. Smith. Uh, Sergeant Smith, are you with us? Uh, yes, sir. I'm here. All I'm right. Enjoying the doctor. I'm sorry. Say that again. I was enjoying the doctor. Enjoying her experience. Oh yeah, 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 yeah. Took you back a little bit, hey? Oh well, only uh, 65 years ago. Man, I tell you, things were a lot different then than they are now. Yes, sir. I, I stand on the shoulders of those that fought in World War II. I was not in World War II. I just mm -hmm. stand on their shoulders. Yeah, my daddy was one of those who uh, he would have he would be he was born in 23. So he would be 99 years old this coming March uh, had he lived. Uh, but he and his generation uh, fought in uh, World War II, and some of them fought in the Korean War as well. Oh, yes. Yeah, the uh, Forgotten War, uh, actually, what they call it, Korean War. But I, I got to thank you so much for your service, sir. And uh, tell us about um, how did you first become uh, interested in, in flying? Well, uh, in my case, uh, I was originally going into the United States Navy believe it or not. Mm. And uh, I walked past the recruiting office at the age of 16, and uh, the Navy recruiter was out to lunch. And this guy uh, said, uh, why don't you come on in here and take the test? And you're not obligated to go into the, uh, the uh, Air Force or anything like that. Uh, so I took the test. And he said, well, you're technically qualified. He said, uh, when can you take the physical? I said, how about two weeks? I told him I was 17. Uh, yeah, yeah. He said, I, I said, how about two weeks, which would have been my 17th birthday? 
So I uh, went to Kentucky. I'm from Ohio originally, Cincinnati. So I went to Kentucky and took the physical. And I took a mental exam. And as I get ready to leave, they said, uh, wait a minute, I want you to take another test. I had no idea what this test was all about. So I took that test. And then when I was leaving, and I realized everybody in there wanted to talk to me, the Marines, the mm -hmm. Army, and everybody wanted to talk to me. I guess I must have scored pretty high on the test. I didn't know. Now, these are white recruiter recruiters? These are all white recruiters. Uh -huh. And the whole office was up kind of excited at some point. You oh, didn't yeah, know what they were excited about. <laughs> everyone wanted to talk to me then, see. Uh -huh. But anyway, I went back and uh, the guy asked me, said, uh, the recruiter, Sergeant Love, I never forget it, said, uh, when can you go? I said, how about two weeks? That was my mother's birthday. Well, I had to give my parents permission. But anyway, they signed, I left. And instead of once I got to uh, Texas, uh, 13 weeks, instead of going to school, they sent me straight to Otis Air Force Base. And what year is this now? It was in uh, 50, 55. Okay. I went to Otis Air Force Base and I went, uh, I was going into radar. I said, what's this? I didn't know anything. I went straight on the job. And next thing I know, I was uh, uh, on the job in radar, the radar operator on the 121 Airborne. Well, yeah, boy, and ground radar. So I was flying on a 121. And I'll never forget the first day I was up there. They took me back in the room up on the aircraft with AWACS. That's mm -hmm. what it was in uh, at that, that early warning. Yeah. And we used to fly 10 to 12 hours on the East Coast, all the way down towards Florida. And we turn around and come back to uh, Massachusetts, Florida down for the defense of the East Coast <clears throat> of the United States of America. That was my job. And the first day up there, the lieutenant called me up and said, want to meet the new airman on the aircraft. And I went up, sat down. He said, sit down over here. And I sat down in co-pilot seat. He said, welcome aboard. He told me who he was and everything. He said, well, won't you grab hold of this, this plane? I said, well, I'm a, I'm an operator, radar. Uh, you know, he said, no, he said, everybody on this plane will fly sometime. If we have an emergency, you're going to have to know how to handle this plane. And there I was going up and down. I must have been going, I don't know. Uh, Dr. Chairman can tell you about this. <laughs> I was just I was just bobbing up and down. <laughs> I didn't know what I was doing. I'd never been in an airplane except to fly to Texas. But after a while, I knew I knew what he was understanding. If we had an emergency, you had to know how to hold a plane up in the air in case I was the only person up there. And I stayed on there, I stayed airborne, uh, then I went to ground radar and eventually on into uh, Denver to intelligence school, uh, Lowry Air Force Base. And, and then I went to the first class of electronic countermeasures, uh, it was 10 of us. And they didn't want any blacks to go, believe it or not, uh, they tried to stop us. Air Defense Command at that time had 10 divisions. They had what? Had 10 divisions. Uh huh. And they sent one person, both of them the top man, a top person, woman, and making a difference to this class. It's a classified secret class that in Biloxi, Mississippi. And the first guy they picked, uh, I was supposed to go. They, they said, no, we're going to send this white guy. And he went. He didn't go. His wife was having a baby. That was his excuse. So they picked another white guy and he was being discharged. And they said, well, I guess we're going to have to send Sergeant Smith. So I went to this class, 16 weeks. When I got to the class, there was four other blacks, African-Americans. They went through the same thing that I went through. So we made a bar. It was a 16-week class. Went to school from 6 o'clock at night to midnight, 6 p.m. to midnight, Monday through Friday. Couldn't take any notes home with you to study. Everything you had to do in a block house, no windows, nothing. So we made a pact that we we're going to go over there and study and make it. We set a curve. The Air Force had a curve. 
For the first class, you set the curve for the next class. So we made a pact that we're going to make it harder for anyone to come through this class easy. Mm. So it got to a point that out of the, all the tests that we took, 11 tests, we had one, if you miss one question, one question, you got an 84. If you missed two questions, you failed the test. That's all occurred. So we made 11, 100. Mm. That one guy missed one question on one test. Mm -hmm. And the instructor came in and said, there'd be no undergraduates in this class because of that. But everyone graduated. The other five guys along with, the, with us, we all finished the class. But mm -hmm. we want to make sure that they would know that what we was doing, we was there, they didn't want us, but we did. So that was uh, a good experience. I retired as an air traffic controller supervisor when I retired 44 years ago. Mm -hmm. Well, thank, thank you for your service. Um, yeah, I, I guess. So are you still in contact with those other uh, guys that you went through the program with? I'm in, in contact with uh, one and he's in Las Vegas. Uh, one of the other guys uh, became a preacher. Uh, they all they, they all retired from the Air Force, and uh, one went up to became a senior master sergeant, and he's retired. Uh, the the other one I I have no idea. I understand he passed. Mm -hmm. But uh, I stay in contact with the one in uh, Las Vegas. Yeah, lifelong friends. That. That's a great story. Thank you so much for your sacrifice and for your service that have um, enabled us to uh, have the benefits that we enjoy today that we take for granted in terms of uh, our freedom and our liberty. And uh, in terms from, from the Black standpoint, in terms of our ability to move into situations that weren't uh, readily available to you guys back in the uh, uh, 50s. And uh, you all paved the way for, for folks that uh, came down the line afterwards. And we can't thank you enough. We appreciate you. And I want to uh, now turn to um, uh, Captain Barrington Irving. Uh, How you doing? Hey guys, how are you doing? Yeah, I'm doing great. Uh, good to see you today. Yeah, good to you, see you, sir. Yeah, you, um, you, you uh, tell us about this plane that you flew solo around the world in. Well, um, let me first say uh, thank you for having me. And it's always great to listen to the heroes that come uh, before us and makes that makes the opportunities and so forth available but yeah so I, I ended up flying around the world when I was 23 years of age and uh, became the youngest person and the first black man to do it uh, but I was able to do it in an aircraft that it's called the Columbia 400 it's a single engine aircraft and I couldn't get anyone to rent me a plane lease me one let me borrow one nothing so i ended up uh you know I was, um, you know this 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 is crazy I, I have to figure out a way to get my hands on an airplane and then it hit me i just had a thought where i basically said to myself you know what i need to i i just had this light bulb moment and i said well hold on when people steal cars what do they do with them and I said, well, they bring them into my neighborhood and um, they strip the car and sell all the parts of the vehicle illegally. So I said, well, if different people make different parts of a car. I wonder if different people make different parts of a plane. Sure enough, that was the case. And I studied uh, 42 different companies who made different parts of this plane, I approached them one by one 
got them to give me the one part they made, and that's how I used some street hustle to get my hands on the aircraft. So you actually uh, put together a bootleg aircraft using yeah. uh, <laughs> using your street uh, your, your street hustle. Uh, yes. And so where where did you where did you build that aircraft? Where, so where did that take place? It ended up being built in Oregon, but we had different manufacturers from all over. And um, it, it was, you know, quite interesting experience to go through um, and do. But I, I, I grew up in Miami, Florida, and I had to travel to these different places. You know, sometimes I'd sleep in a car or try to find a cheap motel or something to stay in. But I went to each manufacturer one by one. And that's that's how I got it done. So you were you had a you you were driven. You were on a mission to uh, to to fly. Did did you know that you wanted to fly around well, the world? What what? How did that happen? No, no. I, I I got introduced to aviation through a random chance meeting with a black airline pilot. And I'll never forget this guy. He stepped out of a nice luxurious truck dressed in this mysterious uniform. And it was it was a United Airlines uniform. I just didn't know what the uniform represented. So I'm just staring at him, saying to myself, "Man, this, this dude looks like he." Yeah, Barrington looks like your um, your um, your signal is kind of weak coming in. Are you uh, still with us? Your story is real interesting. So yeah, Dr. I'm still with you. Okay. Hold on. Hold on one second. Okay. You all, are you able to see me now? Yeah, we can see you and uh, we Hello? can hear Hello? you. We can hear you. You're, you're frozen. Okay. Okay, we awesome. Can hear you. Yeah, we can hear you. Okay. Um, well, ho ho hopefully, I'll be able to pick back up. Yeah, so I, I saw this guy dressed in his uniform and I said to myself, man, this brother looks like he makes a ton of money had no clue what he did. And uh, I just asked him what he, he first approached me and said, hey son, have you ever thought about becoming a pilot? I told him I didn't think I was smart enough to fly a plane. And then I asked him a question. I said, how much money do you make? And when he answered that question, my interest in aviation began right then and there. I, 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 I'll never forget when he told me the answer, I looked up at him and I said, legally? It's like, yeah, it's a real job. This is how much money I make. And that's what first caught my interest. And then when you start to learn about the opportunities uh, within aviation, right? Not just being a pilot, uh, being a technician, engineer, whatever the case may be, there's so many jobs. When you learn about that, it's just how. Uh, um, this is, uh, this, this is something that I'd be interested in doing, even though I would. Dream and, uh, replaced it with another dream of, of of becoming an aviator. Yeah, I, honestly, you know, I played for a high school football team that was ranked number one in the state of Florida, and number one in the entire. And um, once, you know, once I was introduced to aviation, similar to the other stories mentioned, I just fell in love with it. Something different. No two days are the same. It, it, you know, you're not stuck behind a desk and you, you get to see people and, and between have so to me i was attracted by that 
although I must say, I didn't feel like it was the best decision I made. I'll be honest with you. I, I was like, man, what did I do? And it wasn't until, you know, I created a company and started doing things. And I started to realize, man, I'm actually making more money than guys who I played with that made it to the NFL. You know, so all of these opportunities around aviation, STEM, and so forth that exist, it, it's just so powerful. And um, a lot of young people and adults seeking to change careers, they're just unaware. They don't know. Yeah, well, tell us about uh, your, your flying classroom program. So when I was in school, I, um, I always used to ask myself and my teachers the question, when will I actually ever use this stuff in life? Why do I need to learn this stuff? And things started to change for me uh, after, you know, flying around the world. I said, why not create a company where I can travel? I can explore the things kids have to learn, but show them real world aspects. So I utilize aviation as a tool to travel to different parts of the world, conduct expeditions. That's absolutely crazy, whether swimming with jellyfish or jumping out of a plane at 30,000 feet or uh, hunting down viper snakes in the Amazon and or even flying with the Blue Angels. And we utilize this content to help teachers and students understand some of the core things they have to learn in school. And that's why we created the Flying Classroom. Well, it sounds great. And uh, a lot of young people are um, able to um, get a leg up on flying by uh, being a part of your program. And so I applaud you for making that uh, program available. And I want to um, uh, recognize the fact that we've had basically three to four generations uh, of testimony today, starting with uh, uh, the Master Sergeant, uh, Master Sergeant uh, Smith, uh, who got started in the uh, 50s. And then we transitioned up to Dr. Chamberlain, who has some experiences back there during those times, uh, and maybe even earlier with her, uh, with her dad, but she was the next generation that came through and a female at that. And uh, to end it up uh, contemporarily with, uh, with uh, Barrington Irving, a uh, young man that thinks like young people today, the first thing they wanna know is how much money is involved in it, you know? And, uh, you know, that, that's just bottom line, you know, it's, it's tough tough out here so folks want to know how much money is involved and uh, yes and then yeah. to to take it to the next level though to extend uh, uh, towards uh, these uh, young nine and ten year olds who are coming up uh, to offer them the opportunities that you're doing uh, Barrington is, is is great I can only imagine what Trayvon Martin would be today he was a young man who uh, felt a, a calling to aviation and he was involved in aviation training. He would have been 27 years old. Uh, yeah, he was today. in our program. Yeah, yeah, he had his uh, birthday a few days ago. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. no yeah. telling where he- I, 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 I look at pictures of him. I, we still have pictures till this day and his original application. And I look at those pictures and in, and in the pictures, you'll see other students and I can point out doctor, another pilot, a technician. And it's like, man, what would he have become, you know? And, um, you know, part of his dream was wanting to be uh, uh, either a pilot or a mechanic. And we, we still, we have that document framed in our office and I make sure everybody sees that and they, they know what this work is really about. Yeah, in some respects, we've gone a long way, but in other respects, we, rec we recognize we still have a long way to go. I mean, uh, what happened to Trayvon was the fact that he was walking in a uh, white neighborhood and uh, a vigilante uh, thought that he was doing, he, he was suspicious 
and uh, he ended up dead as a result of that. And that was what back in 2013, but mm -hmm. transition up to uh, 2020. Same thing happened to Ahmad Arbery. Um, but I, we've made progress since there were convictions in both state and federal court for the killing for the killers of Ahmad Arbery. Um, but we continue to fight the same forces that uh, that uh, Master Sergeant Smith and Dr. Chamberlain had to deal with. But we're making progress. We have no choice but to continue to fight and to fight here on uh, on land, at sea, in the Navy, uh, Master Sergeant Smith, and in the air. Uh, so you all have uh, trailblazed and, uh, and continue to do so. I just uh, thank you all so much. I wanna thank you for your uh, time, your talents and your contributions to the world of aviation. Your commitment and passion for this industry has created a pathway that many others will travel. And I look at you and I think of how far we have come and uh, you are great examples. Uh, and so you've not only opened doors, but you've also opened the sky and the world for so many others to see. And for that, I thank you. And with that, uh, it looks like you have something you want to interject at this point. Congressman, I do. I wanted to say, don't forget for the future, your, your, your students that you have on, the first aircraft to ever land on Mars was a helicopter. Okay. I right. want to just, for, just look to the future and also a shout out to my family because I am related to Emmett Till. Okay. You just cut out, we can't hear you. Okay. Well, a lot. And I want you to know that there was a Tuskegee Airman, Rainer, Rainer, who retrieved, who accepted him its body. So uh, it's still up in Chicago. So there's a tie for that. And uh, my cousin, Mamie Teal Mobley, actually worked for my, and I get to go ahead and tell this, maybe worked for my mentor, Willa Brown. So the connection with aviation is way beyond, and it's always been there. And in terms of civil rights is concerned, uh, I wanted to get that in. Good to see you, Barrington. He's one of mine, sir. Likewise, no, you are my hero, <laughs> my shero. When he was going around the world, we used to send money. Sheila, look, he needs some, some hotel money. Here, here's the money. <laughs> but don't forget, go to the future. Look to the future. All right, all right. And, and Sergeant uh, Smith, I was thinking that perhaps uh, uh, Dr. Chamberlain missed her calling. Maybe she should have been a lawyer or something. <laughs> well, Congressman, the leading in, um, we have Ms. Piper Burks, who has served as a treasurer for the Atlanta chapter Tuskegee Airmen for more than 10 years and is currently on the executive board for the organization. As a member in good standing with the chapter, she is actively involved in all of the youth programs the chapter sponsors. So I would like to bring on Ms. Piper Burks so she can share some information about that program that Many of you guys just kind of talked about for our young people, and then we're going to close out with our video. All right. I'm unmuting myself. Okay, there you are. Okay, good afternoon, everybody. And this has been an education for me. And uh, thank you, Congressman Johnson, for having this and being on this. And we'll go into our connection a little bit into this. But... Um, just want to say a bit about our chapter, the Tuskegee, Atlanta chapter, Tuskegee Airmen. Uh, our chapter is about 45 years old. And we were founded in 1976. And W.O. Can you turn on your camera? You mind turning your camera on? Who, we can't me? see you. We can't see you. We hear you, but we can't see you. Oh, well, okay. Turn my camera on. I thought my camera was on all this time. I'm looking here at the bottom. Where is it? I don't see it. See those dots, should be those dots at the top right side. And 
it should say start video. There you oh, are. Oh, there, there I am. Good okay. thing I put some lipstick on, huh? <laughs> okay, so, but uh, where was I? We were founded in 1976, the Atlanta chapter. W.O. was one of our original founders. And we have a program that we do every summer. Uh, the TAS program, T-A-A-S-T, -A -A is the Tuskegee Airmen Aviation STEM training, but we have moved on to STREAM from STEM, which is uh, science, technology, reading or robotics, arts and mathematics. Uh, we start every year. In March, we're getting ready to roll out our flyer and get in touch with. And one thing, um, Congressman Johnson, I wanna thank you for is you all's involvement with our program. Um, through Shai and Eric and Zaran because they get all the information and they help disseminate it for us. And also in our program, we have had students that wanted to go into different academies, Air Force academies. So I've been to your office a few times and with the help of your staff, we've had students to come in and be interviewed so that they're eligible for that. So I wanna thank you so much for You're that. Welcome. You're quite Sorry, welcome. Oh, okay, yes. I want to also mention that in our chapter, we still have three DOTAs that are living. DOTAs meaning documented original Tuskegee Airmen, 94-year-old Reverend Thomas N. Bristow Sr., who has had dealings with your office, um, along with Val Archer, 98-year-old Sarah Plummer. She was in supplies. And 100-year-old Dr. Hillard Pouncey, who just turned 100 years old last week. And he was on channel two and channel 11. Mm -hmm. So want to let people know that if you are interested, uh, you can find out about our program, www.atlantatai.org. Check on youth programs. We'll have applications out there. We're working with several high schools. Um, we're working with Morrow, Morrow High School at this point, Arabia Mountain, MLK. Southwest DeKalb. We don't discriminate in high schools and in youth organizations and kids joining into these programs. And it's very, we take them all over the place. We, um, and with the help of Lockheed, Delta, Southwest Air, and also Air Alaska. So we have a lot of sponsors and our goal is to help get kids into aviation. We don't have a lot of kids, women or men in color and pilots, there is a shortage of pilots. So we're trying to work to close in that gap. They need about 22,000 pilots now. So they're making it easier for kids to even train right out of high school. So we'll be dealing with that this summer in our program as well. We have good speakers and presenters that come to our program. We have the TAG Academy, T-A-G-A, -A, which is an Atlanta school, Tuskegee Airmen Global Academy in Atlanta that we collaborate with. And now we're adding Morrow High School. And W.O. being as active as he has been with the chapter is still in the trenches with the chapter. He is our liaison with TAG Academy. And he still does a lot over there with the kids and working with um, equipment and things over there with them. So just wanted to let you guys know that and to let you know how much we appreciate Congressman Johnson, your office in helping us in our endeavors. Well, thank you uh, so much, Ms. Burks. Uh, looks like you're doing quite a lot uh, for our young people, and we will continue to partner with you, uh, you. to um, make sure that these benefits trickle down throughout uh, our communities. And so thank you thank so you. much for all that you do. Again, I want to thank all of the um, uh, panelists or, or the folks uh, who I interviewed, and I see the um, the relatives of uh, of the dearly departed uh, back on the screen, uh, my good friend Gwen Keys Fleming and um, Ms. Archer. Would y'all like to have a few words before we close out? And I just appreciate y'all's time also in, in being with us. Well, I'll defer to Ms. Archer first. Oh, I, I'm just um, very pleased to be part of this. And I, I know that Val, 
would be so proud and to see that the work and what he tried so hard uh, to uh, do uh, and give as much of himself as he could, he would be very proud of it. I would say that he is very proud of it and I'm glad to see uh, him being honored today. And I, it's a privilege for me to just sit here and listen and learn uh, as Ms. Uh, Burke said, I've learned some things today. So um, just thank you so much, uh, Congressman, and for everyone that contributed. Um, and also, uh, Ms. Chamberlain, all of you that contributed today, I really appreciate it. Well, thank you, uh, ma'am. And thank you for your strong support for your husband as he was on the battlefield, um, uh, you know, until his last days, he was yeah. out and about, um, and uh, being an example and an influencer, and uh, we appreciate him so much. So thank you for your support. Yeah. And, and Gwen Keys Fleming, uh, you know, your daddy was, uh, was truly an exceptional man and you are an exceptional product of <laughs> an exceptional uh, mama and a daddy. So we appreciate you being on the call today. It's my pleasure, Congressman. Thank you so much for today. And I echo Mrs. Archer's sentiments. Uh, my dad would be tremendously proud of all uh, that you're doing. And, and my, on behalf of my family, we just thank you for your service and uh, for all that you've done for us. I'll never forget when you presented uh, my mother with the Presidential Medal of Honor or the Presidential Medal of, uh, for the Tuskegee Airmen uh, posthumously to, to my father and presented us with the flag that was flown over the Capitol. That was very, very special. Uh, interestingly enough, my dad didn't talk about being a Tuskegee Airman much when I was growing up. I didn't learn about it until high school. And so uh, I, we didn't have much time, but he uh, left me and my brothers uh, and my sister all of his training manuals, his pictures. Um, so I think that's where I get my pack rat skills from because he held on to them since 1946 when he uh, uh, graduated. Wow. Tuskegee. So uh, it's a special time. And to all the kids out there, just know uh, that if you have a, a dream of flying, you can do it. Uh, my dad loved flying mm -hmm. and uh, going to Newark Airport as a child with his dad. And that's where his love for flying started. And it turned into a history making career for him. So uh, follow your dream. Uh, you've got great examples and Dr. Chamberlain, uh, Sergeant Smith and uh, the uh, Barrington, uh, uh, Barrington Ms. Irving. Uh -huh. uh, so again, thank you. It's a true honor to be here and I wish you all the best. Thank you, uh, Gwen. And you've been doing such a great job uh, commentating on uh, uh, MSNBC and CNN <laughs> and uh, keeping us all informed about the grand jury proceedings and that kind of thing. Real proud of you. Thank you. Thank Real you. Real proud of you. You've been with me since the beginning. Man. Back in 1993. Yeah, so. you, uh, it's been a joy to watch you work. It's been a <laughs> joy to watch you work. So anyway, that's that's all we have, folks. Thank you all so much. Everybody have a great day and stay safe. We got um, another.
right, there we are, Congressman. All right, and we put Putin in, I mean, uh, Trump, <laughs> Trump's photo in there just yeah. to let us know we're back to reality again. <laughs> Let's keep fighting, y'all. Don't give up, don't give out, don't give in. Keep the faith is what John Lewis used to say. Amen. All right, so we're ready to conclude, y'all. We finished. Yes, yes sir. Right. Yes. Okay. Thank y'all so much. Thanks, everyone who was associated with this. I, I thank you so much and have a great day. Thank, thank you. you. You're welcome. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye. Bye.